Queen Anne's County, thank you once again for joining us. Tonight we have the League of Women Voters Virtual Forum. Tonight's program will be about the Board of Education candidates for Queen Anne's County. We're on Facebook this evening, and if you would like to include your questions into Facebook, please just leave a comment right below the video, and we're going to be able to send them over, and hopefully your question will be asked and answered this evening. If we get a lot, we might not reach them, because we do have a time limit, as we have one group meeting at 6 this evening, and the second group meeting at 7. So that's all for me. I'm going to turn it over to Patricia Jamison, who is the League of Women Voters, Queens County President. Thank you. Welcome, and thank you for participating in two back-to-back -back virtual pre-election candidate forums for vacancies on the Queen Anne's County Board of Education. My name is Patricia Jamison, and I am the president of the League of Women Voters of Queen Anne's County. The first form is for the Queen Anne's County Board of Education vacancies in District 3, and the second form is for the vacancies in District 4. The forums are sponsored by the League of Women Voters in collaboration with Queen Anne's County TV. The candidates in tonight's virtual forum have been certified by the State Board of Elections, but did not meet the deadline for their names to be on the general election ballot. However, any one of the write-in candidates for District 3 may be written in as a write-in candidate on a voter's ballot for District 3, and any one of the write-in candidates for District 4 may be written in as a write-in candidate on a voter's ballot for District 4. Remember, voters must write the name of the write-in candidate that they are voting for on the ballot. <laughs> The League of Women Voters is 100 years old this year and is a nonpartisan organization whose membership is open to anyone at least 16 years of age. The founders of the League of Women Voters believed that a nonpartisan league could provide education to the public to assure the success of democracy. Our league, which has been active since 2004, supports the belief that democracy works best when voters make informed decisions, and forms such as this are one way to do that. The league also publishes a voter's guide and information about the Board of Education writing candidates from District 3 and District 4 can be found in the voter's guide on the league's website at lwvqac.org. The Voter's Guide can also be found on the vote411.org website. To learn more about Queen Anne's County's League, go to the League's website, as I said, at lwvqac.org, where you will find a video that was produced in collaboration with Queen Anne's County TV entitled The Vote for Women that overviews the history behind the founding of the National League, as well as provides information about our local Queen Anne's County's League. Remember, your vote is your voice in the election. So please, either vote early or vote by mail or vote in person on November the 3rd. Please vote. Thanks to Mary Camel, who chaired the League's Forum Committee and made certain that all writing candidates received invitations and information and that the press was informed of this event. Mary will also be the timer for both of tonight's virtual forums. A special thanks to Queen Anne's County TV for producing this event and for all of you who are participating by Facebook or by live streaming. Thanks especially to you candidates, you write-in candidates from districts three and four. Well, tonight we have, right now we just have district three sitting in front of us here, but thanks to all of you for your willingness to serve on the Board of Education and for being part of this virtual forum this evening. At this time, I would like to thank and turn things over to Mrs. Barbara Sharkey, our league's former president and current treasurer, who will introduce the candidates from District 3. After this forum closes, there will be a short break, followed by a, quorum, uh, by, by a forum with candidates from District 4. Mrs. Sharkey will moderate both forums. 
Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, Pat. Greece. <clears throat> so um, remember, all these, the candidates are write-in candidates. One will be elected. Um, the format for tonight's uh, forum will be, first of all, each candidate will have one minute to introduce themselves. Um, we're going to do this alphabetically. We're going to start with Ms. Helen Bennett and then move on to the others. Um, the second will be um, starting with Ms. Buffy Cromwell. And and uh, she will, then each candidate will have one and a half minutes to answer a question that they were given beforehand to prepare an answer. Um, and the, Queen, the League of Women Voters of Queen Anne's County decided on that question. Then questions that have been submitted by the public by either email or Facebook, which are coming in as we talk, um, will be directed to the candidates. If the question was directed, I'm losing my mask, sorry. Oh. If the question was directed to a specific candidate, that individual will be given a one and a half minutes to answer the question and then other the other candidates will be asked if they would like to answer the question also. So um, questions that were given to, that were submitted for all the candidates, we will continue the alphabetical rotation as we talked about. They will each have one and a half minutes to answer each question. So at about six, at about 6.40, each candidate, starting with Ms. Pamela Turner Tingle, because we're going to reverse it, um, and she'll be first, will have an opportunity to have a wrap-up session and say kind of whatever they want to say about whatever they want to say. <laughs> um, and we anticipate the forum for District 3 will conclude by 6.50. And as Pat said, Mary Campbell will be assisting with timing to keep everybody on track. She has a, a sign for a 15 minute, 15 second warning, and then one that says stop, means the end of the time. So let's start with the um, introductions. Ms. Bennett, one minute, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting. Thanks to Quack TV for uh, putting us out there. And for everyone who's watching and listening, uh, for taking your time, because I know we're really very busy. Uh, my name is Helen Bennett. I've been in the county since 2010, and I live on the island. Before that, it was in Arlington, Virginia. My husband's been here, though, for 50 years, so he's been here for a while. I immediately immerse myself in the community. I am so passionate about the people who live here. Uh, I work, play, and, and worship in Queen Anne's County. And after I took over the family business, the, I really got to know so many community, com, uh, community members. So I started getting involved um, advocacy work. I, I attend hundreds of meetings, probably more than some of the officials would like me to attend. I uh, planning and zoning ta uh, stack. And I also am on part of the Economic Development Commission, which is one of the citizens commissions. I also applied for the Queen Anne's County Public School Citizens Commission that never got off the ground. And I'm very, very excited and humbled to have an opportunity to serve my community um, in this capacity. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cromwell. Good evening. My name is Buffy Cromwell. I grew up here. I'm actually a graduate from Queen Anne County. I have three children who I raised in this county who also graduated from this county. I have grandchildren that are in school here, and I have other grandchildren that will be coming into the school as well. I have 30 years of involvement in Queen Anne County with the public school system. I actually was a substitute teacher. I was an officer on the PTSA. I shared the first science fair in the county at Bayside Elementary School. I actually just retired three years ago from being the varsity coach at um, Ken Island High School. I also was a coach down at um, Queen, Anne, um, Queen Anne High School as well. Um, I also own a business here, which um, has been in business for over 20 years. Um, at that business, I actually do internships for the kids from Queen Anne County and also um, Ken Island. Um, during that time, we've actually had a lot of kids. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, <sorry. laughs> Thank 
I was like, stop. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Turner Tingle. Hi, everybody. Thank you for hosting tonight. I am so glad to be here to get an opportunity to let everybody know exactly who I am and why I want to do this. So um, I've been in Queen Anne's County since 1971. Um, my dad um, grew up here, and he was in the military. And when he completed his um, work there, he, um, my, him, my mom decided to move here. So I came to uh, Queen Anne's County in third grade. So I went through school here. I have a child who graduated here, and now I have grandchildren here. And to be honest, I did not get involved in anything in the county other than like mediation. I worked for the health department, and I've been involved with um, work at social services, as well as the detention center through the health department. But my passion started as a result of COVID and um, everything that's going on with the kids and the virtual learning and all that stuff. So thanks. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Okay, so now we will move on to the question that was given to the candidates ahead of time. Um, Ms. Cromwell, we're going to start with you, and you have one and a half minutes. I'm going to read the question, but if anybody needs me to repeat it, please don't hesitate to ask me. What is the most important issue facing the school board going forward, and how would you hope to address and resolve that issue? Ms. Cromwell. Um, I believe there's a lot of issues that we are facing right now um, one of them is funding okay I think the state does offer funding um, for us as well as grants so that would be something that I would look into also getting our kids back to school you know and we need to do that in a safe environment um, so I think we need to start low, start slow and actually you know go um, and help parents out there was an another thing that I wanted to say was I really would like to see if parents are having a hard time with the virtual learning like what we can offer to them and you know make it easier on them somehow or some way um, I also am pretty passionate about trade school and I really think that that's something that needs to be um, looked at and revised in Queen Anne County again I think um, I'm a good <laughs> um, I think in um, in our time where we do have technology um, there is a whole industry that's dying so that is one thing that I would actually like to take on if I am you know elected um, in the next four years you know is really providing that for you know students that would be interested in doing trade thank you okay. thanks Ms. Turner Tingle yeah, so um, I told you that the reason that I got interested in the first um, place was because of the coronavirus. And so absolutely, I think that is the most pressing issue currently. And I do agree that children need to be in school. It's science says that in-person learning is the best. Absolutely. However, what has happened in other places where um, school boards kind of force the hand of educators to, to go back into the classroom is that they are taking leave of absences because it's almost that you would have to override a self-preservation mechanism to force yourself to do it because your life is literally on the line. So um, I think that we do need to address it, but I agree that there is a slow going to it and that um, because the educators, the parents, the students themselves would need to, it needs to be a collaborative effort, like um, what would be in the best interest for the majority. Um, and I think that they've already started with the uh, children that have special needs. And um, that has been good. I haven't heard any information about outbreaks and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's imperative that you, um, you get in, you make a small change, and then you monitor. You add a little bit more, and then you monitor more. And that would be my primary focus at this time if I was elected. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bennett. Thank you. Um, I believe the most pressing issue right now is navigating this school year through this pandemic, uh, virtual versus in person. Uh, several months ago, a survey went out that was uh, returned by a 
huge number of parents and about 70% of those respondees said they wanted some form of in-person uh, teaching and that didn't happen right away and I do understand we're getting uh, into that. I've heard from several parents again because with the position that I have at the shop I you know a lot of the parents and even teachers come in and talk to me and this half day is not working for them. Um, you know daycare there's just lots of issues and so Connectivity is still a big issue, especially in our North County, which is so valuable to us, And but they just don't have the connectivity up there. So I think that one thing we can do is do cluster classes. We have so many buildings now that are open. We have county buildings, uh, senior centers. Uh, could we do cluster classes where uh, we have volunteers <coughs> or t educators that would come in and kind of facilitate? That would be kind of like proctoring the classes and, and going off the buildings, hot spots type of thing. So that might be one way to do it. Um, certainly involving all the stakeholders and respecting them. I think one of the parts of the biggest challenge is to get everyone to understand that they're heard, even if we can't necessarily meet all of their physical needs, they need to feel heard and valued, and I'm sure um, that we can come up with a solution for them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on now to um, questions that we have received from the public. These questions have been um, submitted by email ahead of time. Um, they have been vetted. We have combined some of them in um, where there were duplicates and um, for further clarification. So um, we're going to start with uh, Ms. Turner Tingle. You have a minute and a half. And the question is, what exactly do you understand is the job or jobs of the Board of Education and its members? Again, I think it's um, a collaborative effort. It's a, one of a support person um, that no um, person stands alone on the board. And it's a, a group of people trying to meet the needs of the majority. Some people aren't going to get their needs met. Not everybody is. Not everybody does. But the goal would primarily be to ensure that the majority of the students were taken care of and their parents and and their family members, whomever, um, in order to have them graduate, be successful, those kinds of things. So um, I think the key role of the board member is to find out what the needs are and then be an advocate for the students and their families. Thank you. The uh, state and um, the Board of Education, the educators, um, that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bennett. Well, ever since I decided to run, I have spent a lot of time um, researching the Board of Education Handbook. And um, so just reading from it, and because it's, it's important, it's, it's uh, this is very important, and so the legal obligation for policy making resides with the board. Uh, we select, appoint, and evaluate superintendent of schools, formulating, interpreting policies, reviewing policy appeals, adopting and the uh, operating and capital budgets, making decisions on educational, uh, budgetary and financial settlements, approving curriculum guides and courses of study, approving school attendance, acting in a quasi-judicial capacity. Mm -hmm. It is a full-time <laughs> job, and I want to know these things, and I and I will bring my passion, um, all of my knowledge, and I will seek community. Um, partnerships to help us fulfill um, every single thing here that you've tasked us with if, if given the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cromwell. Um, I actually have been studying the book as well <laughs> and I came across the mission statement um, in Queen Anne County Public Schools system which um, which our schools our our public school system here has actually done very well and um, the mission basically is that they're committed to high achievements you know from all of our students here and um, and they want them to thrive and grow in this county and I think that that's something if you're on the board that you actually read this mission statement and you actually provide it to the community and you actually um, 
make it known. You know, it's like from me coaching and it's like I look at all the kids that I have coached throughout the year, like the things that they are doing in this, you know, like what they have graduated from this county and what they're doing in the world is really pretty amazing. Um, there's kids that have come from this county that actually have businesses in Europe and businesses, businesses in Mexico. They've also are doctors and lawyers. They're running hospitals here. Um, I think our mission at this school board, Queen Anne's County, has really accomplished a lot from our, um, you know, from our students here. So, if I was elected, I would actually be a team player on this board. I would actually communicate that to the community, and um, and I would also support it, every every bit of it. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, so the next question may have, you may have answered already in, in some part, but um, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, and we're going to start with Helen Bennett. Um, the question is, do you feel the Queen Anne's County public school system is strong as it is, or does it need considerable improvement in what area, if you think that? And do you feel you can work effectively with the existing members of the school board. Well, that's a, a, a lot to unpack there. there. Um, I, I think it's a great student. I, I agree, a great school system. I agree with Buffy. Again, a lot of the customers that come in are just wonderful um, examples of the school coming in with, from school and they're in their uniforms for their sports and they're talking about what they're doing and, they, and it's wonderful. Um, nothing is perfect in this world so there's always room for improvements especially in times like today when with this pandemic and everything that we're facing like nothing before. Um, the current school board, I think that I can work with anyone. If nothing else I've learned on the Economic Development Commission is you, that's 16 board members. Uh, you have to just, re just respectful. Uh, to have all those different points of view are exciting and wonderful because, you know, we don't have all the answers and you and you want to get a conglomerate and you want to, oh, I never thought about that. And you can come together and come up with the best that you can for your community. So yes, I could. Of course, there's not room for all of the current Board of Education members to be there since um, we've got some up here but um, I absolutely uh, you, that's reconciliation is huge we should all be working towards reconciliation we have got to stop this divide if we're going to do what's best for the school system thanks Good, thank you um, could you just ask the question one more time please sure do you feel the Queen Anne's County public school system is strong as it is now or does it need considerable improvement and if if you think that, then what areas would does it need improvement? And do you feel you can work effectively with the existing members of the school board? Um, I think our our schools right now are amazing. I mean. We do an excellent, the teachers do an excellent job here in our school system. There's always, you know, a possibility for improvement. Um, you know, there's improvement in technology because we're virtual learning now. That's a whole new, you know, thing. So, I mean, that's something that we didn't have to do a couple years ago. Now we're in that process of virtual learning. So how can we make that be the best in our state, you know? I think our teachers are extremely capable of doing that if we allow them, okay? Um, the other part of it is um, I am a team player. I always have been. And um, I really love working with people and listening to people's different ideas. If somebody has you know, something that they want to offer, I actually look at that and say, OK, well, what if we did this? Or what if we did that? You know. So I mean, as far as the board, whoever that may be, I mean, I would be willing to work with them and really expanding you know, on what we can generate in this you know, school system. Um, there was one other point that I wanted to make which I just lost track of. Um, but, but anyway, I just really feel like, oh, for the workforce, I think that there's also, um, I think every child should have the ability to go into a trade school if they need to. I think that that actually needs to be a little bit stronger in our community right now because it's been, you know, kind of passe. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Turner-Tingle. 
Um, one more time, could you restate that question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Do you feel the Queen Anne's County public school system is strong as it is now, or does it need considerable improvement? If yes, then what areas, and do you feel you can work effectively with the existing members of the school board? Yeah, I think that the school board is strong. And I also think that um, if elected, I would be coming with fresh and new eyes, a different passion than is already there. Those are the kinds of things that make a board even stronger, um, is to have, um, to be able to reiterate to someone new what their purpose is and how they're doing things. Because in doing that, a lot of times they realize that what they're doing in the way that they're doing it could be um, done differently, could be enhanced. Um, I absolutely feel like I could work with everybody uh, and anybody because it's important to consider the opinions and ideas of others um, in the learning process. And um, I also think that um, I heard somebody mention divisive, um, and I don't believe I personally have seen that in the board itself. I think what happens a lot of times is people latch on to ideas and it just grows. And I believe what you focus on will grow. So if we're focused on doing the best that we can for the whole community, the students, the educators, their parents, um, and everything, then I think we'll be good. And I also wanted to end with... Um, <clears throat> I am looking forward to an opportunity to learn. This has been a great experience thus far, and I know there's more that I'm gonna learn. I read that book, but you ask me um, what I know, so thank you. Thank you. At this time, we've, we've gotten a couple of questions that people have put in on Facebook. Let's go to one of those, um, um, and we will start with um, Buffy Cromwell. Okay. Um, what are your plans for additions to the curriculum? Um, I think additional plans to the curriculum. Um, I think that there should be, um, I think there should be more involvement in trade. Um, I really think that there's, there's students here that really don't have um, the opportunity to create a freedom with them um, as far as um, creativity. -ness. Um, one thing that I kind of see, it's like the, the kids that I have that come in, I do interior design. So they actually like to work with, you know, fabrics and they like to sew and they like to do that sort of thing. I think when they took out home economics years ago, that they really took out a whole industry for kids actually to prepare, you know, or to actually really like um, sewing or making food or doing, you know, that sort of thing. So I would kind of like to see that brought back in. Um, one other thing that I would like to see too is um, my daughter lives in France and she has to learn a whole new language. Um, I think it would be really nice to start kids at a younger age to speak a foreign language, um, like whether it be Spanish, French, Italian, or whatever. Um, I think that that should be something that's that's in the elementary age group, you know, so it's easier for them. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Turner Tingle, how do you, oh, what are your plans for additions to the curriculum? <laughs> to go <over> there. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of students that are differently abled and those that also have different cultures that I think um, are not recognized in schools. So celebrations and um, even just little things like murals and billboards kind of like in the school that would um, help everybody understand the differences in the culture. Um, and supported by the school itself and the students could be involved. It would foster um, a spirit of inclusion um, and to reduce um, the some of the problems that go on when everybody is not accepted for their own 
for their differences. And so there's a couple of projects and curriculums that are being tried in other schools. And I did receive a question from somebody about that. And I really didn't know enough about it, but I, I did some research. And um, one of the things that they're doing is talking about more of um, the African American studies and things like that in schools. And um, even now we have a um, whole um, group that is part of um, Queen Anne's County that um, has different things that they're bringing to the table. So I would like to see everybody have an opportunity to talk about who they are and just um, get familiar with that. Thanks. Great, thank you. Ms. Bernice. Thanks. I uh, actually agree with Buffy on uh, the home economics, uh, some of those skills that the kids need when they get out, finances, mm -hmm. uh, logic, debate, uh, because I think we sometimes throw things out there and, and then you say, well, why do you feel that way or how did you get there? And it's it, without that debate um, practice or the logic practice, it's hard for them to really, for people to articulate what where they got there. Um, I also am a huge uh, proponent of workforce development. I would love to see the CTEs really explode in the county. It is such a, just as much a viable option as higher education. In fact, as a member of the Economic Development Commission, when I came in there six years ago, we had a subcommittee that worked specifically to try to increase our um, apprenticeships programs, all the CTE programs, and we have invited so many members of the scholarly community to come to our meetings and to be involved in that. So I'm very excited that at the last EDC meeting, there is going to be a position that was created that will work with Queen Anne's County and Kent County to be that liaison, to really plug the, uh, the high schoolers into these programs, paid apprenticeships. Um, it's just, it is the way to go. You know, if you can do something with your hands, um, your family will always be fed. And um, they've thrived during this time, so that's what I would do. Thank mm -hmm. you. Good, thank you. Well, let's go back to the um, emailed questions, um, and we're going to start with Ms. Turner Tingle. Okay. Um, how do you think the school system should accommodate students with learning differences? So, you know, equity in education is really like a big deal. And it doesn't mean that all students get the same thing. It means that each student's needs is evaluated and they get what they need. So there's a, a lot of ways that you could provide um, learning opportunities to, to students that are differently able. It doesn't even have to be in a formal um, classroom setting. And I guess I'm thinking a little bit out of the box because of the pandemic that we're experiencing currently. Um, so in order to provide those services and give resources to kids who are differently able, I know that was the biggest reason that they started bringing them back into the school first, um, so that they could still get their um, specific services. But one of the things that I observed in another county was that um, they met in a park um, with the person who was the provider of the service, and it wasn't like um, they were safe. And they were able to give the child what it needed. And I just think that in this time, we need to be more creative. Um, this is um, motivating us to do things differently so that we can um, pro provide education in an equitable uh, way, but then be inclusive of everybody. So um, I just think we just need to be more creative. Um, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bennett, do you want me to repeat the question? Or? Sure. How do you think the school system should accommodate students with learning differences? Well, they, they do need to accommodate them, and that is something I've heard from a few parents, is this virtual um, learning is not working for their differently child, you know, with the different disabilities or abilities, how um, their students are not learning well. And so, again, I really want to develop community partnerships. Um, it really does take a village. And so to meet the needs of these students and all the students, work with, with the parents to find out what it is that they need and partner with them and, and keep the communication lines open because I think that's 
that's been a challenge during these times is to really communicate well, communicate early, and communicate often to try to meet the needs of these uh, of the students. And again, with the cluster classrooms, um, the park is a great idea to just, you have to really think outside the box, use a lot of different ideas to come up with what will work for them. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Cromwell. Yeah, I actually agree with both of them. <laughs> so um, I think that we do need to look at different possibilities for um, each student to develop, you know, in their own way. Um, you know, whether it is going to a park, actually it could be just a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, um, you know, going into the community and seeing, you know, like our community actually is growing and we're having, you know, elderly people here. I mean, that's a possibility that they could come in and help out in certain areas. I mean, I think we need to really look out of the box and see what, you know, what we can do, you know, for people that need learning, you know, learning differences. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, the next question came in by email also, and um, we're going to start with Ms. Bennett. And the question is, do you believe being on the Queen Anne's County Board of Education means you will have the power to make critical changes to the state curriculum program? That is, with regard to how history is taught in the Queen Anne's County schools and if students will learn about segregation and the civil rights movement? Question mark. Um. <laughs> I think I'm going to address the first part of it because that would address the rest of it, which is do I think that I can make critical changes? The whole, the, I'm sorry, the statement sounds just really harsh anyway, so I would, I'm going to off the top say no. Um, and actually, you as a Board of Education member, you cannot um, act unilaterally. There is nothing that I can do as an individual on the Board of Education that holds up. It has to, everything needs to be done committee. So I could not uh, act on behalf of the BOE on my own. It would need to be an entire BOE decision. Um, that's very clear. So, um, you know, without going in and, and, and looking at things and seeing where um, issues might pop up, budget or whatever, might, no, I would, that, no, I would not have an inclination to go in and critically change um, anything at this moment, so. Okay, and you don't think that you have the power to do that? No, no, that not at all, not, no, you, nothing um, you on my you own. Can. You do not act individually, yes. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Cromwell. It pretty much did a, you don't have the power to do that. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, um, that's, that's all I have to say. Okay, <laughs> Ms. Jerry Dingle. Can you just repeat the second sure. part of that? <laughs> um, well, the second, well, the, the question is, do okay. you believe that the um, Board of Education <coughs> will have the power to make critical changes to the state curriculum program, such as with regard to how history is taught in the Queen Anne's County schools, <coughs> and if students will learn about segregation and the civil rights movement? So, to the first part of the question, absolutely not. Um, I don't have that power. However, I don't want to infer, but I do um, believe that I have an understanding of why the question's being asked. Um, and so to answer the part about changes to the curriculum with regards to the civil rights movement, um, I would be an advocate for changes to be made. I, in and of myself, can't make those changes, but my role as a board member would absolutely be to try to influence people to do things in a different way if it's gonna be beneficial for the students to learn new um, information. So yeah, that would be my answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, great. Okay, the next um, emailed question, um, and Ms. Cromwell, we'll start with you. Knowing that views of how to educate our students have become polarized, what is an issue that you believe in that you believe cuts across political divides? Repeat again, please. Sure. <laughs> Knowing that views of how to educate our students have become polarized, what is an issue that you believe in that you believe cuts across political divides? Um. Um. I really don't know how to answer that question at this particular time. Okay. 
Miss Turner Tingle, would you like to take a stab at it? Sure. <laughs> I believe inclusion, which really um, translates to love to me. And I think um, that no matter where you stand, blue, red, you know what I mean, um, whether you're Democratic or Republican, I think it doesn't matter because our children are important and loving them is what's going to um, help them to be more productive um, adults. And so including their differences, differently abled, um, difference in skin color, different in size. You know, um, the children are teaching me um, how to help include them in things. Um, when we talk about stop bullying and that kind of stuff, all those things are important for children to thrive and grow and learn and be healthy. So inclusion is the thing that I believe cuts across um, those polarized um, areas that it doesn't matter because the whole thing is about just loving the children and wanting to see them empowered and become productive adults. Thank you. Ms. Bennett? Yeah, that was a packed question. Um, there is a lot polarized, and I think we need to focus on where they say we say that how we educate our students is polarized. Education is, is teaching, and I think it's teaching the math, it's teaching civics, it's teaching science. And when you're teaching these things, um, I think if we stay away from opinions, um, there's no reason for any child that I'm teaching a class to, if I'm, if I'm doing a home economics class, for them to know my political opinion, which is where we're seeing so much polarization. There's no need for that. Um, those things, you know, the values, the morals, uh, opinions about uh, what's going on in the world comes from the family. That's where it should be, and that should be the ultimate authority. My role as a teacher or with the education is to just teach my subject matter, and you can do that without opinions, and I think that would cut across all the divides because if you're just teaching facts and you're just teaching your curriculum, um, there's really not much to polarize, uh, so that would be my answer. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We are getting a lot of um, questions in from Facebook, um, and we're <laughs> never going to go through all these questions. <laughs> my gosh, it's 6.40 already. So um, let's just pick one. <laughs> How will you keep kids safe with the virus? And I think it's Ms. Turner Tingle's turn yeah, to be first. Okay, so I'm losing track, sorry. All right. That's okay. Um, yeah. So I think because that was my answer to the question about the most pressing issue. Um, so the science says wear your mask. Wash your hands, um, stay physically distant, and don't touch your face. So I just really want to remind kids at every um, stop that that's what they have to do. I've seen the kindergartners, um, and they seem to be really rocking with this. And I think it's because they've had less time in their school career to, to even wear a mask or not. So they don't know the difference. High schoolers may be having a little bit more difficulty with it, but I think the science has already told us what to do. Um, and one of the things that came up for me lately was a child said that they were going to have a break from their mask if they were quiet. So immediately I had an opinion. And my opinion was that I can't believe they're holding the mask break hostage. But when I said that, when I expressed my opinion, the child explained that when we're talking without our mask, our germs are going to each other. So if we're going to be quiet, we can take it down. I was so impressed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bennett. Um, you know, the science does. They say, you know, to keep the six feet distance, wear your mask, wash your hands, um, and be aware of any symptoms that you might have, check your temperature. You know, you do the best that you can. And, and, and I also don't want to give false hope. I mean, I 
can't say I would keep all students safe from anything. That's unfortunately, it's not the type of world we live in. Falling on the you know the playground or tripping on a, the stairs, um, but you do the best that you can, and everybody just remains vigilant, um, diligent, um, and do all that we can to stay current with the stuff because this is still a very new disease. I mean, they don't really know as much as they're learning something new all the time. So stay you know on top of it and um, remain vigilant. So do the best you can. Thank you. Ms. Cromwell. Yeah, I mean, I agree with both of them. You know, it's like you wear your mask, you wash your hands, you stay six feet apart, um, you clean the surroundings that you're in. I said that's the way that you need to keep it safe and just, you know, do it day by day. So it's like we're learning every day, you know, like what what's happening with the disease. So it's like we, you know, our children are the most precious thing that we have. So we really do want to keep them safe, you know? So, yeah. Thank you. So I have to apologize to our audience and to our candidates because we've run out of time and I've got two pages full of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll have to do this again. <laughs> but I want to take, um, give you one minute each to just have a wrap up and say whatever you want to say about yourself or your feelings. And um, we'll start with Ms. Pamela Turner Tingle. Oh, thank you. Um, I regard myself as a person who um, wants to just be helpful. And I don't really need a title to do that. Um, I'd like to be a board member because I believe I would have um, doors open to me that otherwise would not be. Um, <clears throat> but because of my motivation, which started with the pandemic, to become involved with children, I've encountered them in a lot of different ways. And what I realize is that that we're going to be experiencing the fallout from this for decades. So I just want to get in and um, help to, to um, enhance the services and the education resources that are being provided um, to make it better for the kids. And that's it. That's all. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. And we're going in reverse order, so okay. Ms. Cromwell. All right. Thank next. you very much. Um, I actually love this community. I grew up here. My kids have grown here. Um, I think the school system is pretty amazing, and I think they're doing some amazing things right now. I would like to be a part of that moving forward, you know, like really um, pushing forward into whatever the future holds for us, you know. Um, whether I'm elected or not, I still will be actively involved, you know, with the students in this county. I have been for 30 years. I'm not going to stop. So thank you. Thank you. Good luck to you. Ms. Bennett. Thanks. Um, like Buffy said, I mean, I, I've been involved since I got here. I will continue to stay involved. I'm very excited, though, about um, having an opportunity to serve my community in this capacity. Um, I think that can bring a lot to the table um, and work with partnerships, develop partnerships. Really, I'm passionate about the workforce development. Um, so, you know, I, I ask humbly for you to write in. You can't even just say for the vote. Uh, write in the Helen Bennett. And I think <laughs> Thank you all again for um, for this opportunity to put our, our views out there. Thank you. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, candidates, and thank the audience for all of their wonderful questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to them all. Um, thank you, Queen Anne's County TV, for making this virtual forum possible. And now we're going to take a brief break. Patricia Jameson again I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Queen Anne's County and just want to remind people or just want to mention to those who are watching that the candidates who are sitting here in tonight's uh, forum have been certified by the State Board of Elections but did not meet the deadline for their names to be on the general election ballot. However, any one of the writing candidates for this district, District 4, uh, can be written in on the ballot. What voters have to remember is that the voters must write the name of the writing candidate that they are voting for on the ballot. And I'm sure that all of you have reminded your, <coughs> the people that are supporting you to do that, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yes, that's that's very important. All right, thank you. Turn it over to Barbara, okay. who's going to be moderating for us. Thank you, Pat. 
Um, so I wanna remind everyone this forum is being videotaped and live streamed to Queen Anne's County TV slash Facebook and queenannescounty.org slash live. The recorded forum will be available on Queen Anne's County TV slash YouTube. So this is district four and there are four write-in candidates running. One will be elected. The, the, um, the format will be each candidate will have an opportunity to introduce themselves with a maximum of one minute each, starting with Mr. Mark Ans Anderson. Um, we're going to do this alphabetically. So the next question will be starting with Mr. Sean Foley, and that will be the question that they were given beforehand. Um, and we will follow through alphabetically for all of the questions. At about 7.45, each candidate, starting with Mr. Schifanelli, will um, proceed in the reverse order and will be given one minute for closing remarks. We anticipate the forum for District 4 will be concluded by 8 o'clock. Um, I want to remind everybody that Mayor Campbell will be assisting with timing, with signs, to give a 15 second warning and a stop sign at the end of one minute. So, um, okay, um, Mr. Anderson, would you like to start with your introduction? Of course. Uh, my name is Mark Anderson. I'm a former, former county commissioner uh, for four years. Uh, I asked the governor to appoint me uh, to the school board vacancy. Uh, I did so because I wish to extend public service and I thought this was a good place to do so. Um, a quick background of BS in uh, education, a uh, noted uh, alumni, uh, you know, uh, I'm an incumbent. And so there may be questions that I'm asked that I can't answer because of the rules of the school board. I'll do the best I can. I yield the rest of my time to the gentleman on my left. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Foley. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Foley. Um, I was honored in the school year of 2012 to be elected a student member of the Board of Ed. So I'm really happy to come back and have another shot at it. So instead of uh, my peers electing me um, from Ken Island High School, um, the people of District 4 will have a shot at doing that. So. Um, I graduated from UMBC with a bachelor's of political science, and right now I work at Fort Meade as a defense contractor uh, during the day. So um, that's really it, but thanks for having me. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Hi, my name is Nikki Kennedy. I'm a mother of two students who currently attend Queen Anne's County Public Schools in third and fifth grade. My husband is a Navy veteran and he continues to work as a, um, as a civilian in the military. I'm a first generation college graduate and I received my MFA from IUP on full assistantship with multiple scholarships. I teach Foundations of Art through Chesapeake College to senior citizens. I've been an active volunteer in the community for the past 10 years years while living here, um, volunteering at the school's PTA in the classrooms and with the Green Committee. I have made um, volunteering an important part of my life and from volunteering as reading a reading tutor for kids while and um, most or more recently as an art instructor with multiple local community organizations. Um, I feel that serving your community is, a, is an important part of life. Um, I look forward to being a voice for the students on the Board of Education if elected. And I'm a little nervous. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Schifanelli. Yeah, good evening. <clears throat> My name is Mark Schifanelli, and first of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for uh, hosting this tonight. Um, as an immigration attorney, I've come out of the naturalization room in Baltimore at the court and uh, seen uh, the League of Women Voters registering new citizens to the United States. So I know you guys do good work all over the state in your organization. 
So I've been in the county since uh, 2000. I came here with my wife, and uh, we've raised our three boys here. One just took off to college, and uh, the two are still in school. I have a uh, Bachelor of uh, Government um, and Politics that I earned from University of Maryland with honors uh, magna cum laude. Later, I went to uh, University of Maryland Law School and earned my law degree there. I uh, enlisted in the Army after graduating from Annapolis High School in 1981. I spent 22 years in the Army. Um, after completing college, I did get a commission as an officer, and I've been working as an attorney since 2004 in Queen Anne's County and in Rhonda County. Good, thank you. Okay, um, so this is the question that was given to candidates ahead of time for them to prepare an answer. And uh, Mr. Foley, we're going to start with you. The question is, what is the most important issue facing the school board going forward? And how would you hope to address and resolve that issue? So I think the most important issue that the school board faces is preparing our kids and our students, however you want to say it, um, for college, trade school, further education. Um, we are in a time that just everything is changing. Um, the idea of uh, walking out with a high school uh, diploma is gonna be good enough is unfortunately the way of the past for many, many professions. So making sure that our kids have solid foundations, um, making sure that we prepare them with uh, new technology, making sure that we give them uh, those building blocks to really um, improve themselves and be able to learn new things is going to be critical. Um, when I entered college, I entered at a sort of a big, steep disadvantage um, for sort of a multitude of reasons. And I wanna make sure that no other kid has that uh, issue. So um, kids going to college, kids going to trade school, kids further education after that, uh, we have to do better at preparing them for that stuff and building a solid foundation. And that's it. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Um, I believe going forward, the most important issue that we face is uh, being flexible with our um, expectations of our students. I do think that preparing them for college or careers is a, a very important goal, but that's always kind of been the goal of school. So I think we have to think outside of that and think about what students need before they're reaching that. A lot of our students aren't, uh, not. I, I'm sorry, not a lot. Some of our students um, have other disadvantages um, and I think it's most important that we're making sure that everyone is emotionally um, able to be ready to learn and be in a place where they can um, you know, participate in education. And I think a lot of that has to do with the way that the world is changing. We haven't um, specifically been very critical in the way that the structure of our school meets our children's needs based on how technology has changed and how it's affected students outside of school. So I think um, it, there really needs to be a critical look at the, um, the structure of education, specifically in earlier um, in elementary and middle schools and giving our students the foundation for um, high school and college. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Schifanelli. Well, I think uh, for me, the biggest challenge is going to be uh, student achievement overall. I mean, that's the purpose of the board is to improve student achievement. Um, that's sort of an overarching uh, phrase and uh, multifaceted. But um, it includes a lot of different things. Um, the first one is getting back to school. Um, the kids need in-person learning. There's no question about it. I've watched the board meetings over the past several months, and I've heard the uh, gut-wrenching stories of parents that uh, don't have internet uh, uh, connectivity, or they're having a hard time with schoolology, uh, and various other stories um, that we've heard in this room here. <clears throat> uh, other, just as an example, um, uh, there's the uh, career and technology education, what we all know is trade skills education. Not all the students are college bound and they're not on, all on that track. Um, the state of Maryland, the Board of Education has a vibrant uh, CTE program, trade skills program. Um, I've talked to teachers here in the county that are part of that. Um, and it, it seems to me, and, and a lot of them believe that uh, the program here in Queen Anne's County has been neglected. And so I, I believe one of the challenges uh, that the board will face 
is uh, providing for their students that don't, uh, that are not on that college tra academic track, but on a career track. Um, there's other uh, issues uh, that I look forward to uh, helping with, and that's uh, language arts. Um, there's a big deficit between um, male students at Kent Island and Queen Anne's and female students in their English language arts proficiency in the high school level at least. Uh, the boys were at 50% proficient. The girls were a little higher at 64%. It needs work. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. <clears throat> yes. The number one task for the school board is to safely return students and staff to the classroom. This is not an easy decision. No one board member can achieve anything without the agreement of two other board members. The ideas have to be, and hopefully all, if we return children to school too soon, we'll end up like Greensboro Elementary School in the next door county. The children came back to elementary school on the 29th of September. Just this week, two teachers were tested positive with coronavirus and now four more. We can't risk having this disease spread through our workforce and through our community by opening up the schools too soon. We don't have uh, any meetings with the associations to try to get their feedback. We had one testimony. Um, I have to say, here's the problem. If you start something and you have to then all of a sudden stop it, the parents who relied on the start are left uh, hanging in the woods. Okay, that's it, thank you. So we now will go to, um, I got everybody, didn't I? <laughs> We'll now go to the questions from the public. Um, and we're gonna start with Nikki Kennedy. Uh, what exactly do you understand is the job or jobs of the Board of Education and its members? Um, the job of the Board of Education and its members is to make sure that the, um, the school board is implementing um, quality education to our students to prepare them for the future and to oversee um, the, the superintendent and um, kind of create some checks as far as legislation goes and make sure that everything is legal and everything's done um, by law and to collaborate with the board members to come up with uh, solutions to contemporary problems facing, as well as reaching out to the community and asking for um, concerns, that things that are concerning the community and addressing those needs and giving the community feedback as well. Thank you. Thank you. To Schifanelli. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, well, the first job is to uh, uh, develop a vision of where the board wants to see the school system or the students. The, and that, again, it all leads to student achievement. One of the jobs is to develop the curriculum. Maryland does set uh, standards of achievement that it wants to see um, from graduates and from the students at various levels. Um, it's up to the board to uh, develop the curriculum, to provide curriculum guides, and this is with the advice of the, uh, of the superintendent, of course. Um, another is to uh, ensure that the resources are budgeted for and that the resources are there for the students to succeed uh, in, in reaching the objective of, of learning and student achievement as well. Um, that's about it. Okay, thank you. Mr. We'll make it very simple. <clears throat> Boards of education by law state what and when. We do not get involved with the how. That is taken care of by the superintendent and her staff. 
As soon as we get into the how, we're encroaching in uh, the superintendent's purview, and that is not allowed under the law. So the key is that you have to have uh, a good working relationship with uh, the board and the superintendent and the staff. And if what comes, as Dr. As, uh, Schiff has said, the, all the rest is dealing with policy. We create policy. We do uh, budget uh, preparation. We do budget agreement. Our budgets go to the county commissioners, and the county commissioners oversee it and decide uh, whether what we ask for we get or we get less. What we've gotten in the last number of years is what's called maintenance of effort, and that's typically the legal limit. Thank you. Mr. Foley. So just to sort of expand, we've all sort of covered um, what the Board of Education does. Um, what the Board of Education, um, looking forward, what the Board of Education should be doing, could be doing, and um, what I would like to see them doing is really um, working with our teachers, with our administrators, with the superintendent, um, sort of with the community at large um, to seek out where we can find the efficiencies in our education, to seek out where we can go forth and do better. And if something's working, we'll find something else to work on. Um, so, you know, if it's, if it's how, um, it's giving the teachers um, better ways to succeed, more resources to succeed, uh, giving our students more things that they can go out and do more options. So that is, that's what the Board of Education should be doing, looking forward for our students, looking forward for our teachers, and looking forward for our community, because um, that's their ultimate job and ultimate responsibility. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next question. And Mr. Schifanelli, you will be first. Um, this is again um, emailed in. Do you feel the Queen Anne's County public school system is strong as it is, or does it need considerable improvement? If that's what you think, in what areas? And do you feel you can work effectively with the existing members of the school board? Kind of two parts to the question. Sure. <clears throat> Well, I'll feel the second part first. Um, do I feel that I can work effectively with the uh, other members of the school board? Uh, certainly. Uh, coming out of the military, uh, I can tell you that there's no better feeling to have, uh, to be part of a, a well-functioning team um, and be a, a team player. Um, we, uh, I'm a Boy Scout Scoutmaster, and we teach our kids, you know, leadership and that sort of thing. And one of the things we teach them is when a new team comes together, there's a forming phase, and you may have team members from that have already been there, um, and it's more like a reforming. But the next phase is usually the storming phase, where everybody's trying to work together for the first time, or or certain members are trying to work together, and then they turn into the norming phase. Um, I look forward to being a part of the board, the new board, and uh, and work working with my fellow board members. Uh, unfortunately, my minute is about up. I haven't got to the second part, but. Okay, all right, well, thank you. Mr. Anderson. Could you repeat the question? Sure. Do you feel the Queen Anne's County public school system is strong as it is, or does it need considerable improvement, and in what areas? And do you feel you can work effectively with the existing or new members, since you're a current member of the school board? Well, I'm on the board, and I think so we're able to yeah. congeal into some intelligent decisions. Uh, We've had the opportunity to see what we call tiger groups, where principals and key members of staff, not top members, but key members, and you know, frankly, they represent uh, the, the the third tier from supervise from the superintendent down. Uh, these are incredibly capable people, principals, uh, second in commands, and very impressive. Uh, when they put together uh, this program uh, for the return to school, uh, it demonstrated sufficient detail, uh, enough so that I thought it wasn't going to work. 
Uh, that's a, a sad thing to say, but there are ways that we can improve the return to school. And it is not to rush the return. We put our teachers and staff and children and parents in danger, and it's happened. Okay, Mr. Foley. So to sort of hone in on the first part of the question, um, we, I think that uh, Queen Anne's County does a great job uh, in certain aspects. Our teachers are some of the best in the world. Um, they've, there's, you know, it takes a village mentality out there, um, whether it's helping kids staying late after school, um, doing other stuff in extracurriculars back when we had extracurriculars. Um, but staying in contact with our students is one of the things that our teachers um, do a great job with, um, just from what I've seen and what I've ex experienced in the past. Um, so amplifying that, great. Um, the details that were brought up uh, previously are staggering about the language arts thing. Um, so we probably need to work there a little bit. Uh, but there's some other stuff that we obviously have to do better at. So let's try to do better at it. And then on the second part of the question, um, worked well with the board in 2012. I have no reason to think that I couldn't work well with the board um, going forward. So that's it. Ms. Kennedy. Hi. Um, we chose this area because of the schools. I. I um, have been very happy with the schools that the experience that we've had so far. We think um, the board is doing a great job. I, I know that there's some concern about um, return to school, but I think the plan is being implemented safely and um, following the, the guidelines. Um, progress. I think um, we've, Queen Anne's County in comparatively in Maryland is um, a very good school. It looks great. The numbers look really good. Like we're doing great by our students. We have blue ribbon schools. We are meeting all of these great expectations, but I definitely think that we can do better. Their um, program, I mean, there's legislation, the um, Kirwan Commission and the blue ribbon for school that has money coming for the schools, which will enable the board to put that money into the schools to make it even better. So I think in the future, not only will the schools be great, but it'll we'll be able to do more and work together easily. Thank you. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is directed to uh, Mr. Schifanelli. And, and then everybody can answer if they want to. Um, and this was, again, emailed in. Could you please explain your relationship to the Kent Island Patriot League and what the league represents or promotes in terms of the Queen Anne's County public school system and its curriculum? Certainly. So my relationship to the Kent Island Patriots, well, it's my understanding that the Kent Island Patriots is a Facebook page. I have a Facebook account. I'm not a Facebook person. Um, I might have typed something on Facebook five or six times in the last 12 months. And before that, probably zero. Um, so my wife, uh, Jordana Schifanelli, started Kent Island Patriots Facebook page after uh, the events of this summer when certain uh, uh, school board members uh, uh, try to um, talk about or promote a certain political organization. <clears throat> the parents, uh, a lot of parents uh, voiced concern about that, that she was overstepping her bounds. When they went on other social media posts or platforms, um, a lot of them were vehemently attacked, um, verbally you know, assaulted. There were threats that were made. And so uh, Jordana Schiffinelli created Kent Island Patriots as a way for the residents of the county who were opposed to politics being in school or pushed through the schools where they could voice their opinions without fear of retaliation. So that's, where, uh, that's what it is. It's a Facebook page. Um, I don't think there's any kind of curriculum involved. I'm, I'm, in fact, I'm sure there's not. Um, uh, personally, uh, 
I don't know what to tell you. They're, they're citizens of Queen Anne's County. Uh, they have kids in the schools, and they have a certain uh, opinion. Um, I'm running for a nonpartisan position here, as we know, and uh, and that's it. I really don't have any things spectacular to say about it. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else want to? Um, I'll follow up. I believe that uh, the the group has had multiple meetings at local establishments where they um, have stated. Um, negative comments towards the actions of the superintendent that seemed unfounded in my opinion. I do understand people's concern for politics being in school and being taught to um, children and I feel like if that's a concern it should be brought to the board um, as a concern and addressed in that manner instead of a, a direct personal attack on her as um, the board would then review her statements and then determine if there were any need for action to be taken. Um, I, I know for a fact that she wasn't promoting a political organization. She was um, speaking personally about uh, her herself, so. Okay, uh, anyone else care to yeah. comment? Uh, I thought I heard Schiff say something about uh, school board members saying and doing something. No such thing occurred, that's false. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the Patrix group is a website or Facebook page. People have a right to express their opinions. It's a, it's a free country. Whether one thinks they're correct or not uh, is a matter of choice. Um, the, it's very unfortunate because I know a lot of the people who have done this and their motives are frankly not worth a damn. Uh, they've created a serious problem in the operation of Queen Anne's County's government, education system and so forth. It's too bad. I uh, would have liked it not to occur, but th the group has a right to express their opinion. Mr. Foley, would you care to comment? So, um, other than saying um, that I agree with people's right to express their opinion, um, to sort of look at the larger discussion of whether or not politics should be in school and whether or not politics should be taught in school, um, we're not going to get away with that, um, even though the board is apolitical. And uh, I think I would hope that we strive to be apolitical when we sit on the board. Um, we certainly aren't going to be. Um, apolitical and I kind of wouldn't ask people to do that. I think you should express your opinions and I think we should have a frank and open discussion about um, those opinions, but that's it. Okay. And, but may I rebut, because Mr. Anderson said I said something false. Could you do it half a minute? I can do it in half a minute. All right. The board member was Dr. Kane, we all know, and she's the treasurer of this board and she's the secretary of this board. If she's not, then please so state. Um, the letter that she sent out referred to Black Lives Matter, which is a political organization. I don't want to get into it, but since it was brought up, um, politics is all about the division of resources. If you want to defund the police and take those resources and put them somewhere else, that's a political motivation. That's a political organization. Dr. Kane, by issuing the letter that she did, caused such a turmoil between the parents of the students in this school system that this is what's happened. There's there's division in our school right now because of this politically this political act. There's no place for it. That's why we're nonpartisan on this board. Uh, and I do not believe politics should be in school, in the classroom, or by anybody in a position of administration. Thank you. Thank you. Free butt. Half a minute. Here. It really, this really is not a debate. It's a forum, but go ahead. I know, Have a minute. Here is your sticker. Your sticker is the only piece of information that mentions politics. And what does it say, Mark? It says, get the politics out of school. Thank you, sir. Where are the politics in the school? I just explained it. Yeah, and I don't agree with it. Okay, that's your uh, right to we do We had that. a superintendent who expressed a personal opinion 
And that's on during uh, school hours, I Mark, agree on a school with it or platform. Not is not an issue. No, me either. The but letter was school, addressed to parents and teachers. During school hours on the school platform. And there's actually a law in the Maryland local government article that says uh, specifically Board of Education members sh shall not, under penalty of six months in jail and a $1,000 fine, engage in political activity during school hours or during their time at work. And the Board of Education, so, not a single member did so. Okay. Name, and you name somebody. Dr. Kane, Secretary of this Board of Education. Thank you. Because there's a lot of other questions. Sure. Okay. Um, and Good question. Mark Anderson, we're going to um, move on, and you'll be the first one with this one. How do you think the school system should accommodate students with learning differences? I'm having trouble hearing you through your mask. Uh, how do you think the school system should accommodate students with learning differences? Well, first of all, there are laws that require uh, learning disabilities uh, to be dealt with. And there was another interesting point uh, that got brought up that, uh, that didn't get discussed, but will. And that is the superintendent mentioned in the last meeting that the GPA uh, for students, and we didn't know what body, uh, but when the words GPA are used, it usually refers to middle and high school, were less under the virtual. Well, that brings to, uh, to four an entirely different issue that needs to be dealt with. We need to find out what, the st what group is dragging down the GPA. Is it a little bit from everybody? Not possible if it's down a lot. We need to get into and find out where this is happening. And the only way we can do that is to ask the superintendent to look at the how this is happening. Okay. Mr. Foley, how do you think the school system should accommodate students with learning differences? Okay, so just one thing real quick. Um, I dealt with is probably a really bad way to put it. Um, I have dyslexia, which is called a learning disability. Um, so I have been innately uh, worked into how Queen Anne's County deals with people with learning disabilities. So if that's the question, I'm more than happy to speak about it. But learning differences sort of affect everybody. Um, whether we learn better virtually, whether we learn uh, better with somebody speaking, with reading a textbook, um, we need to do better at doing that. So there's a lot of technology out there that's gonna let us do that. Um, it's really approachable. It's actually really easy to use at college. They use it very easily. There's no reason we can't use technology like that in high school. So if we can get out there and if a student takes a test better in the morning, have them take the test in the morning. If the student takes a test better in the afternoon, have them take the test in the afternoon. Um, they take it better virtually. You know, it's stuff like that has to get worked out for each student and um, policy for the board is going to have to be set overall. So that's going to be pretty hard to do. But um, we're going to obviously work to do better at that. And it's certainly not going to be dealt with. OK. Can Let's you go. repeat the question, please? How do you think the school? Oh. How do you think the school system should accommodate students with learning differences? Um, my son has dyslexia and he um, has had some accommodations made for him that have been really helpful but then in other instances he he hasn't um, he still had to struggle with learning how to read so I think um, that in the future moving forward with the board and um, school in general in Maryland the Commission the Kerwan Commission, the Kerwan Commission has a lot of money going into um, grants to um, help with special education and teaching differences. As an artist, I know that learning hands-on is is has always been the way that I've learned. So I know that. Um, just finding different ways to implement um, and allowing students the freedom to choose their best method for learning. Thank you, Mr. Schifanelli. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
So as a lawyer, my first response is actually ask a question, which I know I can't do that, but what is meant by learning differences? And I think Mr. Foley uh, hit on that, that is a little vague. But if we are talking about students with uh, learning disabilities, then there's a continuum. Um, like Mr. Foley indicated, uh, um, on, on one side of the spectrum uh, or the continuum, the children can still stay in class, they can learn, they just need a little assistance. On the other side of the continuum, it's children with more serious learning disabilities. Um, in either case, they have to be worked with individually, and that's why in the county we have the individual education um, uh, program that uh, the students and the parents and the and the educators get together and develop a plan. So if I'm elected to the board, I will certainly make sure that uh, uh, those students are provided for, that the teachers have the resources to, to do that, um, that the parents are involved to the extent possible. Um, I'm a hands-on guy and uh, and um, whatever I need to do to make that happen so that they're not left behind, I certainly will. Good, thank you. Um, okay, moving on to the next, um, and we're going to start with Mr. Foley. How would you educate students to become good citizens by teaching them to understand and analyze all sides of an issue? So um, critical thinking is a critical skill um, and it needs to be taught. And if it's taught in the realm of um, history or math or physics or how, whatever subject you want, you can incorporate um, the tools of critical thinking and um, looking at it from all sides and hearing all sort of all sides of the argument is a big part of being an adult. And it's a big part of functioning in um, sort of this hyper politicized world we live in. And then sort of coming to that internal understanding and say, okay, I've heard everybody out. Here's what I'm going to do. And here's my um, plan going forward. Um, that's the first step. So teaching smart goals, um, teaching critical thinking, and teaching um, sort of approaching problems and situations and classes and issues from all outside of um, maybe a particular situation. And I know I'm low on time, but um, there is a really cool field called interdisciplinary studies that we definitely should be looking into and definitely should be using when it comes to this. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Um, so I'd like to bring that back to the to the comments about Dr. Kane's email. Um, in her email, she addressed parents. Her email was addressed to parents, not to students. It was um, dear parents and caregivers. And then she called for more dialogue on racism and support for um, the Black Lives Matter movement, which happened to be um, a very contemporary issue right now. That's what a lot of people are upset about, her comments to the parents and caregivers about this contemporary issue. The concern was that students would be indoctrinated. This is what I was hearing from the community, that students would be indoctrinated in Marxist philosophy and um, that that was in, I don't know, some somehow inadvertently political because of the beliefs of the um, movement, although the movement was just, is about um, dialogue. Um, sorry, I just wanna say, um, and this, there was a case in the Supreme Court, it said the classroom is peculiar, peculiarly the marketplace of ideas. The nation's future depends upon leaders trained through wide exposure to that robust exchange of ideas, which discovers truth out of a multitude of tongues rather than through any kind of authoritative selection. That's the Supreme Court in Keisham versus Board of Ed. And I think that goes back to critical thinking. Like we have to teach our kids to be critical thinkers so that we don't have to be scared that they're gonna learn something that we don't believe in at school. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schifanelli. Yes, ma'am. Could you repeat the question, please? Absolutely. How would you how would you educate students to become good citizens by teaching them to understand and al analyze all sides of an issue? Okay. Well, the first thing is is civics. And um, again, as a lawyer, I've taken a look at the Maryland ed Education article, and there is a requirement that uh, uh, schools, all the school systems recognize what's called patriotic occurrences in school. Um, 
and, and civics is a key part of obviously learning to be a good citizen um, as an adult and as a, as a student. Most of our teachers already know, and they and they do do a good job. My kids have come home um, and uh, you know have had assignments to argue two sides of an issue. Um, I don't think that's a problem in our school, um, but it is something to keep an eye on because I've had students, my students, come home and um, with politically charged questions. In other words, one-sided questions uh, without a, an opportunity to argue uh, both sides of. of of the argument to see both sides. Personally, um, when I was in school, I took German and I took French as electives, and um, that probably taught me more than anything to uh, be able to see two sides of an argument. And of course, as a lawyer, I have to do that as a profession, but thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Anderson. My thought on critical thinking, it's created by challenge in the classroom to stimulate thinking even out of the box. Now, does that make a good citizen? No, but it makes a good thinker. Teachers have to challenge the standard thought process and stimulate and reward a child for thinking out of the box. And that's basically how it, I see it should happen. It's something intrinsic to a teacher's ability. If the teacher wants to push the child, the children, the students to think more broadly, you just keep nudging. A good teacher will do that. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Kennedy, let's move on to the next question and you, you're up. <laughs> What would you do? What would you do if elected to promote unity and civility in our county schools? That's a good question. I think um, the Character Counts program is a really great program. It's one that's already adopted by our schools and the Board of Education. I think promoting um, programs like that and advocating for more funding for to continue um, having programs like that to advocate to our legislators for um, specific grants. I know we have a grant for um, a, a specific position for that that's, that we've had for a while just um, uh, finding ways to make sure that the programs are implemented fully in all of the schools and as well as um, the community knowing about these programs. I know that I was a part of the school for and volunteering in the school for a year, I think a full year before I knew about Character Counts. And then once I learned about it, I thought it was an amazing program and they're always looking for volunteers. So um, that program and the other similar programs that are, I think it's um, like community, like creating a community within and without our schools through our school. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Schifanelli. Uh, unity and civility in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, I think the students <laughs> are uh, very unified and, and very civil. Um, they're, they're smarter and, and I think more savvy than a lot of people may give them credit for at times. Um, there is a need, I believe, and after uh, I think everybody here recognizes it, that's uh, um, been watching the school system since the, since the summer uh, for unity and civility. Um, and the remedy, I believe, is to let's focus on teaching the children what they need to know, uh, approving a curriculum that is rooted in math, science, uh, English language arts, that's for sure. And, um, and the subjects that they're gonna need to either survive in the academic world or in the career world and, uh, um, you know, individually. So, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. I would think that the thoughts of unity and civility start in the home uh, and are nurtured in the school system by not creating a situation that causes conflict. Uh, some homes 
don't have unity and civility on this particular issue. And so the student walks into the classroom and the teacher can't change what's already been placed in, uh, in action. In a perfect world, we'd all be part of a civil and uniquely wonderful community. But we get to say and do, or actually say, what's on our mind. Some of those thoughts need to be thought about before they're said. Children follow the patterns set by their parents. Thank you. Mr. Foley. So unity and civility are a um, it's an interesting thought process to sort of go through. It's an interesting way to um, think about it. Um, I think the one thing we have to realize is that when you argue with a entrenched ideologue about anything, um, that you're not going to get anywhere. So if people aren't willing to enter a discussion or a classroom or something and willing to change their mind, willing to hear that other side of the story, willing to have that discussion, um, then I'm not, it's not a waste of time, but it's something that we could do something better doing. So um, I want to have those discussions as much as possible, but when not, um, we obviously need to spend our time focusing on other stuff. So um, I think the open discussion, the willingness to have that discussion at every turn with every student is going to be um, what causes the unity and civility in the long run um, while providing microcosms of um, maybe hard conversations at the dinner table. So, thanks. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Schifanelli, um, it's your turn. And this is the question. How important do you think teacher recruitment and retention is in Queen Anne's County Public Schools? Well, I think it's essential. Um, uh, obviously, we all want quality teachers in the schools. Uh, we do have a lot of quality teachers in the school. The vast majority of them are. Um, I've had three boys go through the, the elementary and middle school system here, schools, and uh, my wife and I have been totally impressed with that, with the teachers and the results that they've gotten for our kids. Um, as far as retention, uh, you know, obviously, I'm the same mind. Um, once the teachers come here, they get to know the community. You know, wherever or if they're from the community, um, we want to keep them if they're good. You know, uh, that's the bottom line. Um, and like I said, the vast majority of them are. So, um, keeping hold of a good thing is is what we want to do. I'm not sure what else to say about that. Um, you know, I know there's logistics there. There's teacher pay and everything else that needs to be that needs to be considered. Um, if I'm elected to the board, I know I've only got a minute or a few seconds, but if I am elected, um, you know, I'm going to be representing the parents and I'm going to be representing the taxpayers that are paying for the school and the, and the community at large, not necessarily the teachers. I don't think the interests are irreconcilable. Um, and I look forward to, to working with all parties. Thank you. Mr. Anderson. I see an HR report every board of ed meeting. We examine uh, those that have left uh, where they, their, their jobs and so forth. <clears throat> and, you know, retirement is a major uh, loss of good trained personnel. But most of those teachers would say they deserved the retirement. They earned it. Uh, I really don't see there exists a problem, but that doesn't mean you don't take proactive uh, <coughs> efforts to see to it that you don't lose people. Now, the legislature uh, did pass something called the Kerwin Bill, but there's no money to support it. It says that a starting pay of a teacher should be $60,000 a year. Our starting pay is considerably below that. We had a lot of things to sort out uh, to be sure that our teachers are paid fairly. Uh, It'd be nice to get some help from those that pass a Comar law requiring something. Thank you. Mr. Foley. 
So there's a quote from the West Wing that I would like to uh, butcher pretty badly. <laughs> um, and it's one of the characters says that we should pay our teachers like star athletes. We should um, look to support them in every um, possible way. At Queen Anne's County, we have some of the best teachers in the world. I think I've said that once. Um, and I'd like to keep saying that. Um, some of my personal heroes were teachers or are teachers here. So um, looking to support them in any way we can is really the best way we can do it. Um, we got to do better about recruiting. We have to do better about teacher pay. We have to do better about um, getting stuff out of um, out of the way of our teachers. I think anybody who's worked any kind of job uh, can point to two or three things and say, this is absolute nonsense. Why are we doing this? This doesn't make any sense. So if we can get that information from the teachers and say, man, this takes up five, six hours a week and I've really not seen any benefit of it um, and figure out, you know, hey, there really is no benefit to this or here's what can uh, cut down on that time. Um, I think we can retain teachers a lot better. Uh, but like I said, we need to change and revolutionize the way we think about um, our teachers because they're the biggest, um, biggest single asset the uh, school board has. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Hi. Um, so I have, there are two ways that I think that we should support our teachers to increase teacher retention. I think, of course, first is pay them fairly, even though they're being paid equal to what the rest of the state of Maryland is paying. Um, I think just nationwide, we know that teachers are underpaid. Nobody says I'm gonna be a teacher because I'm gonna get rich and be a millionaire. They, they do it because they love it, but they still deserve to be paid fair for the amount of um, education that they've received and for the type of job that they have. So with comparable to other fields um, and I think that's all that they're asking for and that's what the the Kerwan um, bill has passed and so hopefully we'll see the um, the resolution of that once the funding is approved which it's just been put on hold and so I'm hopeful that if I'm elected I'll be able to see those types of changes happen secondly I was um, I worked at a school with students for emotional disabilities and I went to multiple conferences with Mansef and I know that one of the um, biggest problems facing teachers is having to deal with discipline in the classroom. And I think if there's a way that we can lessen that burden on, on teachers, which I've seen it done effectively at schools specifically for students with emotional disabilities, kind of transferring that type of, um, those type of skills into the classroom and lessening the burden for the teachers so that they can focus and ha be just less stressed in general. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we're running out of time. I think I'd like to have one more question um, for you all before we do the wrap up. And um, this will start with Mr. Anderson. The question is obviously from a teacher about how many hours outside of a teacher's contracted workday do you think the average teacher spends planning, grading papers, communicating with students and families and attending to other teaching duties? <laughs> If the plans for the hybrid say anything, uh, almost as much as they spend in the classroom, uh, there are requirements for continuing education. There are re uh, requirements to prepare for next day's class and to make notes about today's class. There is an enormous, when I went to school, the teachers complained about hall duty. Now they are literally inundated with an assortment of requirements. An exact hour, some teachers can take more, some teachers will do it in less. I can't answer specifically for every teacher. I do have one moment of history. Uh, when Harry Truman uh, was finished being his, uh, his, his presidency, uh, during an interview, he was asked a simple question and gave a simple answer. Now remember, this is in the mid-50s. He was asked, well, what can we do with education? And his answer was very simply, pay teachers more. And that was in the 50s. And we're now just getting around to uh, possibly dealing with that issue. 
Thank you. Mr. Foley. Can I get the exact wording of the question one more sure. time? I'm sorry. About how many hours outside of a teacher's contracted workday do you think the average teacher spends planning, grading papers, communicating with students and families, and attending to other teaching duties? So while I can't speak for every teacher, um, I have received a couple of emails and I've talked to a couple of teachers and I know a couple of first year teachers who have recently gone through this of spinning up and being a teacher for the first time and it's like at least eight maybe maybe they get eight hours of sleep I don't know um, <laughs> I certainly don't um, for a regular job um, and being a teacher is obviously a creative job, and that job is certainly something that uh, cannot be standardized. There's a lot of mental work that goes into that um, job. There's a lot of technical work that goes into that job. There's many, many, many facets that we cannot um, deal with. So um, I would like to say that teachers probably spend 24 hours a day um, <laughs> thinking about teaching. Um, and I think that the teachers that are willing to do that and that actually do that, um, are, I mean, that's what I say. They're the best teachers in the world, and we got to reward them for that. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. I agree. I, I know a lot of teachers. I've taught high school before. I know that it's it's about 24 hours a day. Like It's it's hard to turn it off, especially if you have an emotional um, relationship with uh, students who are, you know, having issues if there's any type of... Um, conflict in the classroom or in the school or in the in the community like right now what's happening it doesn't stop like the the teachers are feeling the stress and the the um, weight of that constantly so um, I guess I would say for specifically for planning and um, grading papers and responding to questions um, to parents that would be probably about two hours a day additional outside of the contracted work that's realistic like no no question it's definitely at least two hours a day and then um, my exaggerated answer would be 24 hours a day so <laughs> thank you thank you mr schifanelli i'm not even going to try to be exact no. um it's average <laughs> yeah no i know an average day and uh, i had friends who were teachers as well when i was a young man and uh um, I've seen the stacks of test papers and essay papers, et cetera, you know, on, on their desks or on their kitchen tables, uh, what have you, um, that they had to do that night, you know, before the next day. Um, I'm actually married to a professor, and uh, I know that she spends a lot of time uh, preparing to teach uh, uh, law and economics and other classes at uh, university level. I know that uh, takes a lot of time, too. Um, I can relate as a lawyer. Um, you know, you don't leave it in the classroom and teachers um, sense you don't leave it in the office or in the courtroom. You bring it home with you and, and you think about it, you know, at midnight sometimes, um, uh, what's going on, especially with your, you know, client or like um, Ms. Kennedy said, a, a particular student or situation. Um, but we certainly appreciate it, that's for sure. Thank you. So um, we've got lots, lots of questions, but I'm afraid we're going to have to cut it off and we'll go into the wrap ups. Um, uh, Mr. Schifanelli, you're going to start and then we'll go in reverse order. So you've got one minute to tell everything you wanted to, everyone to know. <laughs> well, first of all, again, thank you and uh, the league for hosting this. Um, I'm glad I had an opportunity to uh, uh, let everybody know who I am, everybody here and everybody at home. Uh, and a little bit about what I'm about. Um, if I'm elected, I'll consider it an honor. If I'm not, I consider it an honor uh, having run. Um, uh, if I'm elected, I, I would appreciate uh, input from everybody that's sitting on this board from what I've heard tonight. And I would expect if uh, either one of them is elected, uh, if there's any way I can help with the, with the school system and with the work on the board, certainly let me know. Um, and, uh, and good luck to everybody. Thank you. Good luck to you. Ms. Kennedy. Oh, um... I had a quote, but I lost it. 
Um, I wanted to say thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this forum and to President Patricia Jameson for having us in. Thank you, Barbara Scar Scarkey? Sharkey. Sharkey, sorry, my messy handwriting. Um, thank you for moderating. Um, I'm just gonna look one more time for my quote about. Um, anyway, thank you for um, having me and I, uh, if, if I'm elected, I look forward to serving the community and being part of the community. Thanks. Thank you and good luck to you also. Mr. Foley. So um, there's a lot of unanswered questions today. Um, so shoot me an email, 131, Sean, <laughs> that's S-E-A-N, 131, um, at gmail.com. So numbers, name, numbers again, at gmail.com. And I'll uh, be more than happy to talk to any parent, teacher, community member, anybody who wants to talk about anything. Uh, COVID has forced us to a lot of hurry up and wait. So uh, let me know. But uh, on the flip side, for when it comes to this, there's a lot of stuff that uh, we can do to make Queen Anne's County a awesome school district to prepare our kids, and I hope that I can do that um, in some form or fashion, and if that's uh, serving on this board, I would uh, also consider it an honor. So, thanks. Thank you, and congratulations. Or not congratulations. <laughs> Good, Good luck. luck. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. I uh, have just spent eight months learning what I couldn't do as a Board of Education member. There are a lot of rules uh, and restraints on somebody that was an entrepreneur that says, well, here, this is the problem, let's go do this. And no, there's a procedure which one has to go through. Uh, Maryland uh, School of Law, these 800 pages deal with education law, period. Uh, you win, you get it. <laughs> uh, we have a good school system. Uh, there are things that need to be done to improve it. And while I'm not going to comment on what those things could be, there are ways to improve where we are. And I'm going to continue working on those until somebody is sworn in. If it's me, I'll continue. If it's somebody else, I'll help them continue it. Thank you, thank you and good luck to you. I wanna thank all of you for for running for this wonderful position and taking the time out of your personal lives for it and feeling so strongly about the school system in Queen Anne's County. Um, and I also wanna give a special thank you to Queen Anne's County TV right. and all the work that thank they you. do. I think we wouldn't be able to have a forum That's right. in this time if it wasn't for Queen Anne's County TV. So thank you and good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you ladies.